Why should Christians study the theory of evolution? If we study it, won't we lose our Christian faith? I don't think so. Whether we like it or not, the theory of evolution isn't going anywhere. So the better that we can understand it, the more we can make sense of it and see how it actually is in harmony with our Christian faith. So let's talk about it today on the Science and Faith Podcast. He is the professor for theology and science for the Faculty of Theology at Freie Universität Amsterdam, and he's an ordained minister in the Protestant Church in the Netherlands. He's the author of the book Philosophy of Science for Theologians. He's also co-author of Church, uh, Christian Dogmatics. And uh, his latest book, Reform Theology and Evolutionary Theory, explores key issues in the evolutionary theory from a reformed theological perspective. It's my great pleasure to welcome to the podcast today, Dr. Hiesbert van der Brink. Hiesbert, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Thank you. So let's let's jump right in with this topic of uh, of evolution, uh, which which your book uh, deals with from a from a reformed theological perspective. And let me just ask you: Why should Christians, not even just from a strictly reformed theological perspective, but why should Christians in general study evolution and learn about evolution? Well, I think a, a theory of biological evolution is quite well established in, in, contempor in the contemporary sciences. It uh, has a lot of uh, uh, impact on, 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 all, uh, on many of the sciences, on many scientific theories uh, across the board. Um, so if you want to become uh, trained in the, in, in the sciences, for example, or you want to know how um, we now think uh, things work, um, you should make yourself familiar, familiarize yourself with, with the theory of, of evolution. You, you, usually it's being, it starts already at secondary schools, uh, where uh, I think, uh, rightly so, uh, pupils uh, are uh, familiarized with, with the basics of evolutionary theory. And uh, it's inescapable to somehow uh, face this theory, I believe. And Christians don't don't have an um, shouldn't 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 be an exception here. They should also um, try to study this and try to ask uh, perhaps hard questions as how to uh, relay this theory to their faith. So you don't see evolution as a particularly special area of science any more than we would talk about studying physics or chemistry or ecology or mathematics or any or you know any of those other sciences. For you, evolutionary biology is simply just another field of science that Christians should engage in. Yeah, I, I do realize, however, that it's not just one more scientific theory. And that is because the theory of biological evolution has become associated with so many uh, ideological uh, overtones and interpretations, uh, especially atheistic ones. Uh, that hasn't been the case with the theory of gravity in physics, for example. Um, and that's, that's an important reason why... Uh, Christians um, might be hesitating to uh, delve into the theory of evolution and at least see themselves confronted with, uh, with a couple of questions uh, in relation to their faith, which, are not, uh, which do not come up when you study uh, the average theory in one of the other sciences. So, so it, in, in one sense, it, it's a science like all other sciences. Yeah. But in another sense, it does things that other sciences don't do. So for, like you said, for example, gravitational theory doesn't somehow yeah. um, present certain questions about scripture and things said in scripture. Whereas in, in, ev in evolutionary theory, um, saying that all human beings share a common ancestor with apes and chimpanzees, at least on the surface tends to bring up a contradiction in people's minds about the biblical narrative of the creation of Adam and Eve. Yeah. So let me ask you then, what do we do when we have, because there, there are lots of different answers to this question, so I, I'd like to know what, what you think. You have a, an interpretation from the Bible, let's say Adam and Eve, for example, um, that's been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, for centuries. And then we learn something in science that maybe that's not true. It can feel like if we adjust our interpretation of scripture that we're adjusting scripture itself. So what do we do when, when something has been believed by the church for hundreds of years, but then we learn something in science that says, hey, this may not actually be true. How should we as Christians respond? Yeah, yeah. First of all, uh, it's it's uh, perhaps necessary to to add that this didn't come up. These questions didn't come up with evolutionary theory uh, long before Darwin came on the scene. 
uh, geologists already have discovered that the uh, the Earth is most probably much much older than only four to six thousand years, as can be calculated when you um, uh, put uh, biblical uh, stories from Genesis together uh, and uh, add up the, the ages which are mentioned there. Uh, then you may end up with uh, some six uh, thousand years. If you stretch things, perhaps ten thousand years, but never uh, much 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 further as as geologists uh, have discovered. These geologists were Christians most of the time. And they were very uh, uh, hesitant to uh, give up on uh, this biblical chronology, um, in a sense. But then they discovered that they, they couldn't just fix the things together. So um, uh, over time, they decided that uh, scripture had not been read in such a way as to prescribe a certain age of the earth. And um, because of, because of, this was because of the empirical facts, they were so strong that they couldn't uh, continue uh, the, in this line uh, longer. So th this is not just starting right now. This is uh, uh, 18th century, what I'm talking about right now. And in the 19th century, this was indeed, um, uh, this problem was indeed reinvigorated by, by Darwin's theory of evolution, because now other uh, aspects of the biblical uh, storyline also came to be questions on what exactly these um, these aspects wanted to convey to us, and then uh, theologians started to study again the, the materials from from, uh, for example, the book of Genesis, and they also found out that there are quite some parallels to these stories in uh, other Near Eastern um, ancient Near Eastern uh, cultures. And they came to see what exactly is so special about the biblical stories. And that doesn't have to do with the ages, uh, but it has to do with the theological message, with the message that it's God who created heaven and earth. And it's God who uh, took care of uh, uh, humans to, uh, to emerge and took special care uh, to, to humanity to uh, uh, come into existence. So I think to some extent, one can say that evolutionary theory has helped Christians to come to a better understanding of what is actually so special and so costly about the message of the first chapters of Genesis. Hmm. So as you have, you've written broadly about evolutionary theory in your book. Yeah. Um, so as a theologian and as a pastor and as a Christian, as you've approached the evolutionary topic, were there any precautions or, um, were there any dangers that you wanted to avoid as you approached this topic? When I when I was first in seminary, one of my one of my first semesters in seminary, um, I had a seminary professor say that as Christians, when we approach theology and we approach the Bible, um, we should be careful to take into consideration, for example, the historical interpretations of the Bible. Um, and uh, for one thing, second thing is taken to consideration a broad denominational perspectives on the Bible and on theology. And so there were some, there were some pitfalls that, that my professors wanted me to avoid. That is uh, keeping a narrow mind and going in with just one position and, and looking to reinforce that position. As a theologian, pastor, and, and Christian, as you were approaching evolution, did you have any precautions in mind? Was there anything that you wanted to avoid or any dangers you wanted to escape as you approached it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, first of all, um, I, I, I had to learn myself uh, as well to be open-minded. I, I, I stem from uh, what I sometimes call a, a latently creationist background. So it was not very open or explicit, but implicitly it was creationist. So in my own case, there was a, a reticence to uh, take evolutionary theory seriously, to have an open mind to it. So it took a while before I met uh, a scientists who were Christians and who told me that we, we cannot get around uh, without evolutionary theory. So we just need this theory in our work uh, to be taken seriously. So that, that uh, finally um, made me come up with a more open mind to study it. On the other hand, secondly, I also uh, uh, um, see many precautions for those who are too enthusiastic or, or, or think it's innocent to study evolutionary theory. I had a professor who said, well, it doesn't matter whether evolutionary theory is true or not. Evolutionary theory just tells us how God did the thing. It's not nothing more than that. And that's too innocent, that, that's too naive, I believe. So um, that's because uh, precisely what I uh, pointed out earlier that um, in, in, uh, in the course of history, evolutionary uh, theory has become entangled with so many ideological views and so many atheists have to, uh, and are being are using evolutionary theory as a kind of platform to uh, launch their ideas and to suggest that if you 
um, executive entrepreneurship theory, you should become an atheist. Oh, these are pitfalls that I try to point out to my students that they don't that they have to be very well aware or, or about um, of where they could safely go as Christians and where there are areas where it becomes ideological and where they should be very cautious and uh, not to proceed. So, so one of my students actually came up with a nice metaphor. He said the, 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 the uh, sphere of uh, evolutionary theory is like, a, and, and everything uh, associated with it, it's like a morass and you are a kind of guide. So you point out this is a path you can safely walk through to the end, but here you should be careful not to go further. And I like that. I like that metaphor because that's what I try to do in my book. I try to disentangle the, let's say, scientific, factual parts of evolutionary theory, with which we just have to come to terms, whether we like it or not. Uh, and I try to distinguish these from from the more ideological overtones and the uh, elaborations in in, in ideological uh, ideological directions, uh, which we should definitely um, be very critical of. Yeah, and it seems that as as you read the historical responses to uh, Darwinian evolutions, particularly um, Darwin's two books, the On the Origin of Species and The Descent of Man, even back in the late 19th century, when you read the responses that were written then to the to the publication of those books, um, there seems to be a lot of concern on the part of theologians, the theological responses, there seems to be a lot of concern about the potential implications, uh, the philosophical implications of this, yeah. and that um, there was a lot of concern about the idea of God being left out, the uh, design, designer, um, all of these uh, important aspects of the Christian faith, um, it seems like people, this was not something that was developed by new atheists. This was not something that was developed in the 20, late 20th or even the 21st century. The, the concern about evolutionary theory seems to go all the way back to the very be beginning. I put that in quotation marks because evolutionary theory didn't begin with Darwin. But, um, but in Darwinian evolution, this seems to have been a, a, a real problem in people's minds uh, from the beginning. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So what you what you see if you look at the the first stage of the reception history of Darwin is that Darwin's theory were were, were immediately almost immediately hijacked as it were by by uh, agnostic or atheistic uh, scholars uh, who argued that Darwin finally helped us to get rid of religion. And uh, these were people like uh, Thomas Huxley in uh, England and uh, uh, Haeckel and Haeckel in, in Germany. And uh, uh, they uh, wrote prolifically in, in, along these lines. So that caused a kind of, of response uh, to Christians. They, they said, well, if this is what evolutionary theory is about, then we just can't swallow it. Uh, for example, the founder of my own university, Abram Kuyper, is quite famous these days, also in the United States. States. Uh, he um, uh, came up with a rectoral address. Uh, I believe it was in 1880 or some, 1890 or something like that. And he, uh, in this uh, address called Evolution, simply Evolution, he warned his uh, audience against the perils and uh, the dangers of evolutionary theory because he had read Haeckel and, and Spencer and so on. Um, so, so he had this this ideological uh, uh, elaboration of of evolutionary theory in mind. And at the very end of the lecture, he says, "Well, if you just try to disentangle things and just look very uh, cl in a clean way to the idea that forms of life might emerge from each other, then a Christian has nothing against that." He says, "But it's just the ideological way in which it was hijacked, as it were." Uh, which made uh, Kuiper and so many other Christians so very critical uh, of, of evolutionary theory. Charles Hodge is another uh, case in point here. So it's really important for, for Christians today <clears throat> to distinguish between evolution and evolutionism, or what right. we could say, the, the, the scientific theory of evolution and the materialistic philosophical um, aspects of, of, of evolution that sees evolution as, an, as a worldview, as an ex, uh, as an ex having explanatory power to, uh, for for the world, so ideologically Christians need to be careful about how about how they accept evolution, what aspects of evolution they accept. Um, but what happens when you've got young Christian minds? I mean, teenagers, for example, who are who are told that. Um, well, the world is young, relatively young, or that Adam and Eve were the first humans created. 
And then we look at the scientific aspects of evolution, not the ideological ones, but we look at the scientific aspects of evolution. We see old age, long epochs of time. We, we see that uh, the biology and the genetics seem to confirm that all human beings are not related to one single human pair, but probably a, a, a community of people about 10,000 or so. And so we start to see the genetic evidence that, that quote unquote contradicts Genesis. What do we do now? Because we're not we're not adopting the ide the ideology of evolutionism and materialistic philosophy, but at the same time, the science seems to be contradicting um, what a lot of Christians are being told. Yeah. So this is tricky because what we often see happening is that these teenagers who are raised in a creationist environment and then they start uh, their uh, academic studies or go to college uh, or whatever. And, and then they may become impressed by the evidence actually for evolutionary theory. And since they uh, always have learned that it's either or, either evolution is true or what the Bible tells us is true, uh, they may quite easily come to dismiss of their background, their religious background and of the Bible. And they might be tempted to think that uh, given the evidence for evolutionary theory, uh, the consequence of that must be that the Bible hasn't any anything to, to tell or doesn't have any weight. Uh, and I regret that very much. So one of my, what, what drives me in writing such books as, this, as, the, as the latest one, is that I would like to help people in seeing that it's not either or. So you can take the Bible seriously. You can also take the first chapters of Genesis very seriously. And at the, at the same time, um, accept the, 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 the hard data of, of, of evolution. Mm -hmm. And I try to point out in my book in, in, what, along what lines that, that it's possible to do so. Yeah, this, this might be getting a little off topic, but, but it raised the question in my mind um, about the nature of truth. Mm -hmm. So um, Peter Enns in his book um, uh, about Adam and the, the evolution of Adam, he, he actually argues that Paul in the New Testament and the, the, the first century Jews, they actually believed the opening chapters of Genesis to be literal, historical, accurate depictions of how God created, when God created, and, and everything. Yeah. Um, he, he accepts that. But what he, what he essentially then goes on to argue is that um, it's not that they were wrong, but they were wrong. They, that, that these were actually not literal historical documents and, and depictions. Um, does, what does this tell us then about the nature of truth? Because if, can, can truth be um, not subjective in, in, a, in a moral relativistic sense? I don't mean that. But what I mean is can truth be situational in that God, God was, uh, so to speak, accommodating for the... Uh, the time and place in which he was talking to the, his audience, uh, you know, ancient Israel, either, um, you know, depending on where you date Genesis, could God be um, communicating to them truth as they would have understand it and received it? But today, that truth needs to be interpreted in a different way. And so does, is the nature of truth somewhat less concrete and objective as we might think of it as being yeah so so personally i'm not inclined to go that way uh because um so so if you are going to qualify or really to relativize the nature of truth you you know you don't know for sure where you may end up in a, in a very rel relativistic position I, d I don't want to go that way but i do uh, actually uh appreciate your uh, choice of the word accommodate does god accommodate to uh to the uh, audience to the first audience of the of the bible for example in uh, conveying uh, what god wanted to convey to reveal to them and uh, that that's a very appropriate word it was uh, used already by someone like john calvin uh, one of the founding fathers of the reform tradition and he argued that uh, in uh, communicating with uh, with humans god took the position of a nurse who is uh, sitting on her knees and then trying to talk to uh, a little toddler in terms which the toddler can understand. And since we humans have so little, uh, so small uh, capacity uh, to, to understand God, to comprehend uh, who God is, God had to do so in this way in order to, uh, to, um, um, to help us understand what, what he wanted us to understand. And he did not, in, in uh, communicating with us, God did not want to 
uh, inform us about the latest state of affairs of 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 the the, 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 the biological and physical backgrounds of the universe or of the earth that, that was not at all uh, what God wanted to convey uh, since he wanted to enter into a relationship with human beings uh, he he made a covenant with with humans and he revealed himself to them in his uh, love and grace and glory. And he wanted them to answer his uh, uh, his offer. And uh, when 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 humans refused to do so, I, th I believe in that the story of the fall can still be and should still be taken quite literally in a sense that God uh, came to send his, uh, his his only son to um, save humanity. And that th that story that's the basic storyline of the Bible, I believe. And uh, that's irrespective of evolu evolutionary theory. If God would have started to tell. Um, uh, ancient Near Eastern people uh, about the Big Bang and about billions of years. Uh, they simply could not. They could not somehow uh, conceptualize that. They, they couldn't. They, they would simply not understand what God was intending to do. So would, God would never have been able to come to the uh, core of of, the, of what He wanted to communicate to them. So, so that's not so important. The world picture uh, which we are raised with is not that important. And the, the gospel has been able to adapt to to, to various uh, pictures of how the world is built up and and emerged. So I, I just want to avoid you or I getting angry emails about. Okay. Any comments we might have made about truth. So I just want to I want to want to summarize that both you and I believe in the objectivity of truth, and we are opposing yeah, yeah, yeah. relativism in terms of interpreting truth. But I I thought the question had to be yeah, asked. Okay, that's a good question. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. <laughs> All right. There. So please don't email us about angry stuff. <laughs> um, then so so then let's let's shift a little bit from talking about the the, the science and, and evolutionary theory, and talking about God, um, as as theologian. Um, as you as you reflect on God, knowledge of God, the pursuit of God, does knowing and understanding not just uh, things about God, but even uh, in a personal way, understanding and relating to God in a, in a personal way, how does that help us with understanding evolution when we look at evolution? Yeah, so first of all, I think if as a Christian you... Um, you you base your the confidence which you have in life is based in your relationship with God and in the trustworthiness of God and the reliability of God's promises. Then you perhaps you won't be blown away so easily by something like evolutionary theory. You can perhaps uh, stand out and um, in a sense that you are able to realize that things might be different on that score than you had ever imagined uh, they were. But since you are sure of, uh, uh, your, of, of God being there and of, of, of securing your, your, your fate and uh, being, being your uh, father, your life being uh, hidden in Christ with God, as Paul says somewhere, uh, that, then that doesn't matter that much how actually uh, the world came into existence or, or how biodiversity emerged uh, this might easily be um, uh, delegate or relegated to the realm of the scientists you can say well that's that's for them to sort out uh, it's not that my faith is dependent on that kind of uh, theories because it's much wider and much deeper than uh, than that. Sometimes it seems that when Christians vehemently oppose evolutionary theory, there's a kind of anxiety behind this, which mm. you shouldn't expect uh, uh, from Christians, uh, I would say. Mm. Yeah. So that's one way, at least, perhaps the most basic way in which in which faith in God can help you to come to terms with evolution. Now, let's flip that. Let's turn that around and say, okay, let's look at, as Christians, let's look at evolutionary theory. Let's look at the evolutionary narrative from beginning to present, from Big Bang to where to COVID. And, and we, we see that evolutionary narrative unfold. We see all the universe um, developing and changing. As we, as we look at that, I guess this, this kind of comes from more of a natural theology uh, position. Is it okay for us to read that evolutionary narrative and draw conclusions about God, about his nature and his character. Can we, is there something that to be learned about God by studying evolution? Yes, definitely. I, th I think so, but in a limited way. So, so um, 
uh, so many Christians, uh, in many Christian traditions, you have this fabulous metaphor of the two books. So nature and the Bible serving as God's two books, the two books through which God makes himself known to us. I think this is, a, this is a, an instructive metaphor. This still is an instructive metaphor in that nature may serve as God's first book in which we get to know him uh, in, in the first instance. And we especially come to know and marvel at his uh, wisdom and glory and majesty. Uh, because if you look into uh, the way in which uh, the universe is built up uh, and also the way in which uh, various species have emerged over time. This is so uh, extraordinarily marvelous uh, that it requires uh, a, a mind much greater than ours uh, to devise all this. Uh, and um, uh, it really can uh, expand your, um, your appreciation and, and your uh, wondering about uh, God's greatness if you study uh, biological evolution. I'm, I'm definitely sure about that. But having said that, uh, it, it does, it does, you do end up with only a limited picture of God because you do not so easily come across God's love and grace in nature. There's much suffering, of course, uh, involved in the evolutionary story of the world. Um, and it's difficult, it's hard to understand why so much suffering has been going on for, for, for millions of years already on the planet. Um, so there are also quite a lot of things which we do not quite understand and which is, uh, is hard to reconcile with what we thought uh, and the image of God would look like. So that's why we definitely need, still need the Bible. We cannot suffice with nature but because the Bible says it's in Jesus Christ that you can find the love of God. And mm -hmm. not necessarily outside, not necessarily all over the place, but but look, into, look at Jesus Christ because it, it, it's in him that God has revealed all his character as it were. Um, so that's the, the way in which the two uh, cohere, in my view, the two books of God go here. And uh, that's what we can learn and what we cannot learn from, from, um, uh, the, from nature. Yeah. So using, uh, um, just kind of thinking about your response, uh, I'm going to use an imperfect illustration. Um, but if I wanted to get, I, I'm a huge Harry Potter fan. I love the Harry Potter books. If I wanted to get to know J.K. Rowling as an author, I could read the Harry Potter books. And um, there's some insight to be learned about who she is as a person, how, how her mind thinks, the kind of imagination in her world that, you know, that she's created kind of is a reflection of who she is as a person. So there's something to be learned about her. But that's very, very different and very, very limited to uh -huh. as opposed to doing something like reading her autobiography and or, or interviewing her yeah. interviewing her personally. Yeah. Um, yeah, or talking with her, you know, over a cup of coffee. Those are far more intimate and, and effective ways of knowing her personally than just simply reading the Harry Potter books. And, and so is it, is it, would you agree that it's kind of like that where like we can read the evolutionary narrative and say, there's some cool things, that insights that we can gain from about yeah. God from reading the evolutionary narrative, but they're, they're limited and they have their purpose, but you've got to go beyond that to, yeah. to, yeah. to, to scripture to learn more about God. Yeah, thank you. That's a, I think I think that's a very appropriate metaphor. So so if you want to get to know an author of a book, you learn so much more when you would be able to talk to him or her than just reading the books. Although you can learn some things by by reading uh, the books of the author. That's a very uh, apt uh, apt uh, way of putting it. Good. Well, his new book, uh, Reform Theology and Evolutionary Theory, it explores the key issues in the evolutionary theory and, and, and theology debate. So if you're interested in that topic and looking to maybe resolve some conflicts that you have in your mind or um, you have some questions that you want to explore further and, and, and kind of resolve some of those issues, I cannot recommend this book highly enough. It's 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 very well written, very easy to understand, and it it's uh, it's just a great book that kind of brings the two worlds of evolutionary theory and reform theology together in a in a helpful uh, way. So I would highly encourage each of you to to pick up a copy of the book. It's uh, published by W. B. Erdman's Publishing, and it's available on Amazon, and you can uh, order it today. And I, I, was, I was actually browsing on Amazon yesterday, and I noticed I think it's on sale. Uh, so I think the publisher has oh. it on sale. So go ahead and pick it up, uh, a copy. And uh, if you guys have a question about evolutionary theory, about reform theology, or any other topics that we cover here on the podcast, please feel free uh, to reach out to us, and we'll be able to, uh, to, to uh, respond with, with those as best we can. 
Hisbert, I want to thank you again for being on uh, today. It's been a real pleasure and a joy to talk with you. It was my pleasure. Thank you. So if you guys have a question, feel free to email us. Our email address is scienceandfaithdortmund at gmail.com. Go ahead and fire away a question, or if you have a suggestion for a theme or a topic for a future episode, send us that as well. We'll do our best to, uh, to try to integrate that. Also check out our website. We have lots of articles up there and resources available. Uh, the address for that is scienceandfaith.de. Thanks so much for tuning in today, and we will see you guys next time.